I love a lot of theorems in mathematics, but there's one theorem that has caused more of a paradigm shift in how I view and interact with the world than any others, and that's the existence theorem of Nash equilibriums. This theorem in game theory, which I'm going to tell you about in this video, has applications in so many fields, but let's begin with football, or soccer as it's called here in Canada. Because empirical studies of football players have found that in situations like, say, penalty kicks, football players naturally tend to play according to, well, the best outcomes of game theory. And even more interesting, if you take football players back to the lab and give them puzzles on game theory, football players are better able to intuitively solve game theory puzzles than the average person. So what's going on here? My thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this playlist on game theory, more about them at the end of the video. Let's imagine that I take a penalty kick. This here is my imaginary friend who will be the goalie, and here's the ball. There are a lot of spots for me to aim at, but I'm going to simplify a little bit and say I can either kick to the right or to the left. And my friend is a pretty great imaginary goalie, so if they jump to the same side that I kick it, then let's just say that they always stop the ball. And I'm a pretty good imaginary kicker, so if the goalie jumps to the opposite side that I kick it, let's say that it always goes in the net. So the challenge for us is, should we kick to the right or kick to the left? Or perhaps we should sometimes kick to the right and sometimes kick to the left, and if so, with what frequency? Well, what do you think? I mean, it's 50-50, right? You should just about evenly decide whether you're going to the right or to the left, because if you, for instance, always went to the right, then the goalie could always go to the right and always block you. Even if you went to the right just slightly more than 50% of the time, say 60% of the time, then the goalie could respond by just going right 100% of the time and they would do better than they would have otherwise. Instead of a 50-50 shot of blocking it, they'd get a 60-40 shot because you're going to the right 60% of the time. And then if you flip this situation around and think about it from the goalie's perspective, and let's try to imagine that this goalie can't actually anticipate whether you're going to the left or the right, they can't read your body language. They just have to think, well, what are they likely to do? And let's say again, it has to be 50-50. If they're more likely to commit to the right, say, then the kicker can respond by going more to the left. But if both players are 50-50 as whether they're going left or right, we have a very interesting phenomenon that comes out, which is indifference. If I tell you I'm kicking to the left or the right 50% each, then you don't have any particular motivation to go to the left or to the right in any particular instance. That is, you are now indifferent, and my choosing to do a 50-50 split has made you indifferent to the choice between going left and going right. Okay, so this illustrates, at least intuitively, two of the big themes that I want to talk about in this video. One is about playing mixed strategies. A, a pure strategy is like you always go to the right or always go to the left, but a mixed strategy is when you play a bit probabilistically. Sometimes you go to the right and sometimes you go to the left with different percentages. In this case, I've argued that 50-50 is the right number. And often in our life, we sort of decide one best course of action. We play pure strategies too much in our life. If we think about playing mixed strategies, then we actually have the ability to put our opponents in this place of indifference. And that leads me to the second really big theme about Nash equilibriums, which I haven't yet defined yet, but it's all about putting your opponents in this place of indifference, where it doesn't matter whether they ultimately choose to go right or left in any particular scenario. Because you are playing this mixed strategy, their choice is equally good either way. Before we jump to the definition of the Nash equilibrium, let me introduce first the idea of an expected payoff. And this is how we deal with what the reward that we're going to receive is in a probabilistic situation. So for example, imagine that you were just going to flip a coin and if it was heads you'd win a dollar and if it was tails you'd lose a dollar. Well, in that scenario, the expected payoff is this expression where the two 0.5s are basically probabilities. There's a 50% chance it's going to be heads, and a 50% chance it's going to be tails. And then the payoffs are the $1 and the minus $1. In this case, 0 0.5 times 1 plus 0 0.5 times minus 1 just adds up to 0. Which means if you were to play this game over and over and over again, the expected payoff, the amount of money you would expect to earn, would just be $0. So with that said, now we can state the idea of a Nash equilibrium. A Nash equilibrium is a choice of mixed strategy for every single player, 
such that no player can unilaterally improve their expected payoff. That is, nobody can do any better. You're sort of stuck there at the equilibrium because nobody can change their strategy to improve by themselves. In our football example where both players were choosing 50-50 between left and right, this situation meant that no player could improve. No one could change their strategy from the 50-50 by themselves and do any better. So Nash equilibriums have this sense of stability, and, and what's truly remarkable about them is the so-called Nash existence theorem. And it says every single game, well, as long as it's structured in this way, it's got a finite number of players, a finite number of strategies they can choose between, then every such game has at least, possibly more, at least one Nash equilibrium. And this is so powerful because if you're playing any game, whether it's a recreational game or a real world situation that you model in a game like this, then you know that you can go out and try to find that Nash equilibrium and then play it. A way that's gonna make all of your opponents indifferent. Let's go back to the football penalty kick example. I wanna show you a little bit more formally how to get to that same 50-50 because that's gonna empower us to be able to do more sophisticated examples like an economics example, which I'm gonna do next. So what I've done is describe that game in terms of a payoff matrix. By the way, previously in the game theory series, we've seen a lot of these payoff matrix, but basically what I've done is for both the kicker and the goalie, I've given the two options, left or right. And then in each of the squares, I've written down a pair of numbers. So for example, this minus one, one, it refers to when the kicker goes left and the goalie goes left. And in that scenario, if they both go to the same side, it's the kicker who loses, so they get minus one. The first number always represents the kicker. They get minus one, and the goalie who stops it, they're gonna get plus one. This is a way of assigning numbers to the idea of winning and losing. If you go to another quadrant, for example, this one where the kicker goes left and the goalie goes right, that's good for the kicker, right? Went to the opposite side, they get one, and then the goalie gets minus one. And you can go through the other squares similarly. So this kind of payoff matrix we've seen before, but what I'm gonna do that's new in our game theory series is I'm going to add some variables. First, I'm gonna put up an X and a one minus X here for the kicker. And, and what I'm trying to denote here is a mixed strategy. I'm saying here, what if the kicker decides to go left a percentage X, and then they're going right an amount one minus X. The kicker only has two options, so X plus one minus X is just one or 100%. That is, I divided out probabilistically their two options. Likewise for the goalie. The goalie is gonna go left an amount Y, and then right an amount one minus Y. Again, this adds up to 100%. Okay, so I've introduced these variables, but how can I use the idea of a Nash equilibrium in making people indifferent? So let's think about it from the kicker's perspective. From the kicker's perspective, to achieve the Nash equilibrium, they want to make the goalie indifferent, so that the goalie doesn't care whether they go left or right, that going left or right is gonna have equal payoff to them. So what that means is, let's compute out the expectation for the goalie if the goalie goes left. And I'll do that same sort of expectation formula we've done. The x and the one minus x, those are the probabilities, so they're gonna come out the front. Then the payoffs, well, those are coming from the one and the minus one. And I'm choosing them from this first column here because I'm saying this is the expectation when the goalie goes left. The two payoffs are either one and minus one, and I put them into the two cases into my expected payoff formula as well. Now, here's the real key. This is the expected payoff for the goalie of going left. If the goalie is gonna be indifferent, this better be exactly equal to the expected payoff if the goalie goes right. So in other words, we're saying it doesn't matter whether you go left or the right, the expected payoff in both of those two situations is exactly the same. That will impose a Nash equilibrium. I get the same kind of formula over here, the x and the one minus x are our probabilities, but our payoffs now come from the second column because the expected payoff when the goalie goes right. So I plug in the minus one and the one, and so now I have these two different sides to an equation in the variable x, I can solve for x. Specifically, I can clean this all up, and this is just two x is two one minus x, and then you can clean that up even further and get x is equal to one half, which we had already intuitively figured out that it was. The kicker should go left half the time, and here we just managed to prove it. You could do the exact same computation. Indeed, I would encourage you to pause the video and try to do it again. This is for the goalie trying to make the kicker indifferent, to make the kicker indifferent, the expectation on the left and the right have to be the same. Do the exact same type of computation, you get that y is one half as well. So 
We have recaptured our intuitive answer that the Nash equilibrium for this game is when both players are going left and right 50-50. Okay, so now that we've done this for the football example, let's see a slightly more sophisticated example that comes to us from economics. In this example, I'm going to imagine I have two firms, firm one and firm two, and they're competing. Specifically, they're trying to decide, should they enter some new market? Maybe they're both smartphone manufacturers and they're trying to decide whether or not they should go into the market of making smart watches. I don't know. Both firms that are competing have two choices. They could enter the market or they could stay out of the market. And so I've denoted these choices E for enter and S for stay out. And I've put the numbers up into a little normal form game here. And so basically the minus 50 minus 50 is if both enter the market, they pay a ton of fixed cost to get into the market, but because of the competition, they just lose money. They're both down 50 units. If they both stay out of the market, it's just zero, zero. Nobody makes anything, but nobody spends any money to enter the market. And the real thing would be that if one of them entered the market and the other didn't, the one that entered would be able to get all of the profits because there'd be none of this competition. So the one who entered would get 100 units of profit and the one who stayed out would just be at zero. If you've been paying attention to the previous videos in this series, you'll note that these two options are actually both what we called pure Nash equilibria when we did not allow any mixed strategies. Because if this is the scenario, like if one person's in the market, the other person's not going to want to enter it, they'd go from zero to minus 50. So these as pure strategies are both Nash equilibriums, but we are allowed to have mixed strategies. So let's do the same thing that we just did before. I'm going to put an X and a one minus X for the choices for firm one. I'll put a Y and a one minus Y as probabilities for the choices for firm two. And then what should we do? Well, the same kind of analysis. If we want to find a Nash equilibrium from firm one's perspective, they want to make firm two be indifferent. That is, they want the expectation for firm two to enter and to stay out to be equal. And if they could make that expected payoff equal, then firm two would be indifferent to their two choices. So we can write down what these equations are going to be. Again, the probabilities are the x and the 1 minus x, and the payoffs come from our table, the minus 50 and the 100. I plug those in, and then I get this expression. For the expected payoff if you stay out, same thing, there's the x and the 1 minus x, but now the payoffs come from the right column, 0 and 0. That's going to be all nice and easy when I plug those in, because this is just going to be the same thing as 0. I can clean up the top line, this is the same thing as 100 minus 150x, and so we get the value x is two-thirds. So what this means is that firm one should try and enter the market two-thirds of the time. If they do that, if they enter two-thirds of the time, then firm two is indifferent. They're like, I could stay out, I could enter, it doesn't make any difference. Either way, my expectation will be exactly the same. Expectation of staying out of the market is zero, so either way, their expectation is zero. You can do the exact analogous computation, I'll let you do it, and see that firm one is indifferent if firm two decides to enter the market two-thirds of the time. And you can sort of imagine how a two-thirds probability might actually happen. For example, you can imagine a firm that's trying to expand around the United States, and, and they're looking at all the different states that they could go in and try to enter and compete in all of those individual states, and they might end up saying, well, look, I'm going to do about two-thirds of the time I'm going to enter them, one-third of the time I'm going to not. And that's going to maintain this Nash equilibrium. And the real key here is that if one player plays at this two-thirds rate, the other player is just completely indifferent. It doesn't matter what they do. They could always enter, in which case one-third of the time they'd win the 100 units and two-thirds of the time they'd lose the 50 units, which just adds up to zero expectation. But if they ever decided to deviate, say one of the firms was like, nah, I'm just going to stay out, I'm never going to bother expanding, my expected payoff was zero anyway, so I'm just going to stay out and just be at zero, then the other firm could respond to that and be like, oh, well, if they're not ever going to enter the market, I'll just enter the market 100% of the time. It's only when they're playing at that two-thirds amount that both firms become indifferent. And so that's my final message to you. Whether you're playing a recreational game or a real-world situation that you're going to model with game theory, Try to play a mixed strategy where you're thinking about different probabilities between your different actions and specifically choose a mixed strategy that makes your opponents indifferent. That will give you the Nash Equilibrium.
Now, to really master mathematics, you need to do more than just watch videos. You have to get your hands dirty by actually doing mathematics. And that's why I am so proud that this series on game theory is sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is an online learning platform that has just a delightful amount of interactivity in its many, many courses. I want to show you one really cool example that I was playing around with earlier. This is in the course Calculus in a Nutshell, and it really tries to build up your understanding of the big ideas from Calculus. The example is Gabriel's Horn, and it's kind of mind-bending. You start with the curve 1 over x, and then you form a sort of infinite horn by rotating it around the x-axis. You can see here how interactive Brilliant's courses are, as I can visualize that rotation by dragging the slider. The crazy part about Gabriel's horn is that we can compute the volume, and it turns out to be a finite number. It, in fact, it's just pi. But if you compute the surface area, it is infinite. So this is a surface with a finite volume enclosed by the surface, but an infinite surface area. That's crazy. And as a math professor, what I really love about Brilliant is it doesn't just state the formulas and get you to compute them out to get these answers. It also shows you the big geometric ideas behind those formulas so you can really understand why the formulas work the way they do. That is so powerful. So definitely go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett and sign up for free or the first 200 people to use that referral link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. And with that, please give a video a like for the YouTube algorithm. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.